Africa to uh, welcome Mark Wigley to the AA. Uh, he is, of course, no stranger to the AA. He has been lecturing here, I think, quite a few times in the last uh, few years. Um, uh, you know, I have been uh, for quite some time an admirer of uh, Mark's work. He is uh, probably one of the most prolific and, I think, significant writers on architectural uh, theory and, and practice today. Um, I think most of us first became familiar with Marx's work when he, of course, building on material from philosophy and critical theory, was able to reconceptualize the very notion of an architectural project. And uh, some of this early work uh, led to his collaboration with Philip Johnson on the, uh, by now infamous, the Deconstruction Exhibition and its accompanying publication, uh, Deconstructivist Architecture, published by the Museum of Modern Art in New York. Subsequently, of course, we are also uh, familiar with uh, uh, his book, The Architecture of Deconstruction, subtitled Derrida's Haunt. Um, over the last few years, um, I think there has um, been also a, a, a slight shift in, uh, in Marx's writing, whereas this uh, early work, in a sense, used the material from outside architecture. Now I think uh, the more recent work is working much more uh, directly with the material of architecture itself. And uh, it's uh, uh, a great pleasure for us to have him here to uh, talk about his new work, the, the book titled, uh, entitled White Walls, Design Addresses, the Fashioning of uh, Modern Architecture. Would you please join me in welcoming Mark Wigley. Uh, thanks, Martian. It's, uh, it's really a great pleasure to be in London and to be particularly here at the AA. Um, at the same time, I don't know really how well things are going to go tonight. Um, because it's a very strange thing to talk about a book. Uh, because books are anyway very strange things. Um, but worse than that is to, is to survive the strange moment that a book appears in the world com completely alien from you. And that's the nice part is that it's so alien. And the trouble with a lecture like this is it forces you to sort of reacquaint yourself with your own writing. Um, and it's not necessarily a comfortable thing to do. So. Having said that, <laughs> uh, I will talk about some of the issues raised by the book, which will, will mean that I will move pretty fast and, and, and will generalize far too much. In other words, there simply isn't the time, to state the obvious, to go into the detailed argument of the book. And since the book is about details, this pretty much slaughters me from the beginning. So. Uh, Maybe once I will come down from, from some ridiculous height and moving at some sort of concord speed uh, and just take some time reading uh, some parts of the argument so that at least you get a feel for um, how things might be somewhat better, I hope. Anyway, uh, I will deal with, with essentially what constitutes the second half of the book or the is issues raised by the second half of the book, which is primarily the issue of colour. Um, as you may know, the book is about white walls, and, and you know, of course, I'm surrounded by them here. Um, but we're surrounded by them all the time, and that's that's the issue. And I guess it's makes it's pretty obvious that whatever you're surrounded by all the time, you don't see. In fact, you see everything that's that occurs outside of that. And in fact, that's the great claim, of course, about the white wall is that it makes everything in front of it visible. Uh, I can see you, and you can see me because of these bright white walls that we're in. I could help you by wearing a white shirt, for instance, might sort of throw me up more clearly, present my head to you as a kind of floating target. Um, and so it makes sense that we don't really talk about that very much, but it's very, very weird for architects not to talk about that, since the architects are putting the white walls on these buildings. And of course, they're not always putting the white surface on. Sometimes they're using a different material, sometimes they're not using paint at all. So it's very, very strange for us not to talk about white walls. And it's more than strange, it's utterly absurd that we don't talk about the white walls of modern architecture because probably that's the one thing about modern architecture that we all accept. 
Um, everybody would want to say, well, modern architecture is a very, a very heterogeneous phenomenon and we shouldn't make any generalizations about that, and it's true. And it's true that the history of discussions about modern architecture are riddled with ridiculous assumptions that obliterate the vast <coughs> differences between not just all the different architects, but within the work of each particular architect. So even the very name that we use, modern architecture, is a title uh, which can only be used with a certain kind of blindness to an astonishing brutality to the um, historical uh, record. And also the record that's, as it were, still sitting in front of us all the time. For instance, this room and its attempt to modernize itself by, by re-coating its inside surface with these white walls. In the same way that a lot of London at a certain moment of time did the same thing on the outside. So it's not just an outside or inside phenomenon, it's all over the place. Um, so I want to deal with this obvious aspect of modern architecture, which nobody ever talks about, and of course if, if it's so obvious and nobody talks about it, and I really mean almost nobody, um, then something's going on. And that's that, that feeling that something is going on, was it the Simpson case, what was it? Uh, something's not right or something like that. Um, the feeling that something doesn't quite add up, that there must be something that we don't want to see. If the white walls are so obvious and it's so easy to see them, if we don't talk about them, there must be something there um, that we don't want to talk about. And since I'm, by nature, <coughs> conspiracy theorist, um, the book is trying to construct uh, a version of what the crime is or what the conspiracy is. Um, and it's just one version um, and I'm happy, like people who talk about the grassy knoll, to go on and on about it probably for the rest of my life. But anyway, uh, here we go. Um, if we could grab some slides. <coughs> Can you do the lights down? This will give you time to reacquaint yourself with images that I don't have to show you. Uh, a lot of the images I show you today, I won't have to show you. Um, again, it's not just that we're surrounded by white walls, we're surrounded as architects by images of white walls, white walls that are almost kind of embedded, or there's some kind of after image which is constantly hanging around us. We know these images, we know them very well. They have been, of course, reproduced in extraordinarily large numbers. This is the Weisenhof Siedlung of 1927. Of course, it's a crucial uh, moment uh, in the history of the story of white walls and white architecture. Because this is the moment, of course, that a bunch of architects, architects that would later, and I would insist later, would be constructed as the heroic figures uh, of modern architecture. A good proportion of them gathered together on the side of a hill uh, overlooking uh, Stuttgart. Uh, in fact, a hill with the sort of uncannily prophetic name of Weisenhof, kind of uh, court of white. Um, and these are images, uh, the image on the left is the standard image used by the Werkborn, German Deutsche Werkborn, which sponsored the exhibition. That was their standard image to represent the exhibition in their journal, uh, De Form. The image on the right uh, is a nighttime image to show you that even this white image survives the night and is carefully constructed to survive the night. And this is the last image from uh, Bau und Wohnung, which is the uh, official catalogue of this expo exposition, building and dwelling. Of course, this is a subset of, as you all know, and I'm sorry to, to rehearse some of uh, the familiar story to you, of a, a much larger and perhaps more interesting exhibition on the theme of uh, uh, the dwelling, involving many more architects and, and interior designers. Anyway, about two months before this exhibition opened, its director, Mies van der Rohe, wrote to a number of architects and asked them to, as he put it, choose the lightest shade of colour possible to preserve what he called a sense of unity. Um, now, during a meeting in Stuttgart a few days later, which was attended by about half of the architects, JPP Out was there, Le Corbusier, Adolf Schneck, Adolf Reding, Matt Stamm and Joseph Frank attended, and they all agreed that they could go a little bit further than just being light coloration. They all agreed that off-white uh, would be used for all the exterior surfaces. And we could even stop then, uh, right at that point, because in fact, by and large, the white of modern architecture was off-white. So in, in a sense, we could al already at that moment uh, retell the story, which is to say a white very unlike that used, let's say, by somebody like Richard Meyer. So again, one has to understand the total surrealism of the work of people working in white today relative to the very tradition which they claim to be 
uh, working on, which is, I suppose, what makes Richard Meyer postmodern, according to a lot of other definitions. Uh, his white is so is such a cartoon of white that it's in that sense exactly it has exa that coloration has probably the same role as the pastel colours of Michael Graves and so on and so on. But that's a discussion for another day. Um, anyway, so this is w what appears to be largely white settlement. Photographs produced, of course, in black and white to produce this image of unity. It was absolutely crucial for all the architects involved to demonstrate that while they were all different and coming from different countries, they, they were literally chosen to represent certain countries, they had to present a unified front. Uh, and that front, of course, once that image of unity could be produced, and it was, a, as it were, a black and white image, or white on black, uh, at that moment, the, you could then go set about the business of constructing such a thing as modern architecture. Right? It's simply not possible to do so without images like this that reassure you that, in fact, these architects operating within very, very traditions very, very different traditions, very, very different uh, theoretical perspectives and so on, could be con conceived of as all working uh, together at the same uh, moment. Now, of course, there had been, by that time in 27, already a long history of buildings that had gradually codified the practice of white walls, uh, running through, uh, most obviously, the works of Voisy, Mackintosh, Otto Wagner, Adolf Loos, and so on. And, you know, one could go on and on, Bailey Scott, etc., etc. Um, but these were... I would suggest, somewhat scattered incidents. Uh, white, and of course I'm referring here to high architectural practices. A whole other story would have to be told to deal with the white uh, that's arriving in houses according to whole different logics um, of uh, hygiene and, and, and so on. Uh, white had, had been used um, to unify a, a number of large developments before this, whether they were speculative, kind of conceptual schemes like uh, Garnier's uh, City Industrial of 1904 to 1917, which in literally envisions the modern city as a coordinated ensemble of buildings in the spirit of the Mediterranean, uh, or Victor Bourgeois City Moderne of 1922 to 25, uh, equally a kind of conceptual image of a white community, architectural community. Or there were built projects, uh, and I'm thinking, I mean, uh, just uh, of the many projects, ones that interest me, um, Herman Mutasius' housing scheme at Hellerau of 1910, or J.P.P. Out's, JPP Out's uh, Whitdorp, which literally White Village, which was constructed in uh, uh, 1923, or even, um, and probably too obviously, uh, Walter Gropius' Bauhaus uh, complex at Dessau of 1925 to 26, so the years immediately before the Weisenhof. But the Weisenhof and again, these are images from the official catalogue. The Weisenhof was really, I would suggest, the first time that this code was simply accepted by a very uh, diverse range of architects to produce this kind of image. Uh, the, the success of the image of the, of the, of the I was going to say exhibition, but it's true to say the success of the image depended on the collaboration uh, of the architects and the collaboration also of the media by which those architects <coughs> were uh, represented. The, the seamless white skin that cloaked the buildings along with the flat roof, which was the only other stipulation by the organizers. So they basically had two rules. One was uh, had to be off-white outer surfaces of the buildings and had to be flat roofs. Uh, those two rules uh, were key to the maintenance of that image. And again, you see here on the left, again from the official catalog, this is the Weisenhof Siedlung under construction, and on the right is the image afterwards. So if it's the case that this white image matters, it's really the difference between the left and the right that's crucial here, which is to say the moment that you get a white skin which is concealing the construction techniques being used by the architects. And not just concealing the construction techniques per se, but also the different techniques that are being used by the different architects to produce, uh, again, just to give you a sense, to produce that kind of image from that on the left. Now, of course, in fact, there was a lot of color uh, in the Weisenhof Siedlung. Uh, strangely enough, since I used a non-tungsten a non corrected film on the left, my black and white shot assumes this sort of pale, uh, this sort of ghostly white. But there you have a, a, an image from uh, a little bit later. These images are coming from around about 1930, which is to say a moment in which the, the uh, uh, settlement is really established and has taken on a slightly different tone than when it was first constructed, but you see, of course, the color on the right. And you only just start to get a sense uh, uh, of the colors, um, but that's a function of the particular angle of this photograph and also the nature uh, uh, 
of the colours used. Only about a third of the houses were completely off-white, that is to say only a third of them played by the rules, despite the fact that the white image is what results and successfully results. Most of the rest were various shades, light shades, which in, this, in as much as they were light carried out the original intention of Mises' request for light shades. Um, Peter Behrens' apartment, for instance, his block was in a light ochre colour, Mies was in light pink, uh, Hilbersheimer's in light grey, Bourgeois in light red ochre and so on and on. But those of Bruno Taut, uh, Much Stam and Le Corbusier, of course working in partnership with um, Pierre Genere, were heavily coloured. Uh, starting with Much Stam's scheme again, Every now and then I would keep an image there for you to show you the before and after because it's this shocking difference between the image on the left and the right uh, that has to be confronted, this kind of before and after uh, advertisement which is still current in the literature around uh, the time. Stam's row of three houses were lavender blue on the front with dark porches and yellow on the sides and the back. Bruno Taut's house deployed bright shades of yellow, deep blue, red, green and black. Here it is again on the left. Le Corbusier's uh, smaller Citroën house, uh, you see on the left there, was pink, while his double house on the right was a white volume suspended on, on, on blue-gray pillow tea and burnt sienna retaining wall, a wall that re-emerges in the roof terrace alongside green, blue-brown, yellow and blue-gray surfaces with gray around the servant rooms below and pale green around the staircases attached to the back. The interiors employed white, dark grey, yellow, burnt sienna, dark brown and light blue. Um, and these are the classic images of the colour scheme. On the right is a piece of wallpaper on the back of which the various colours have been attached by Le Corbusier which he's sending this document from Paris to Stuttgart where Alfred Roth was doing the supervision for the, for the, for the building and these are the um, very, very pale renderings of the location of the colours in the drawing on the left. Now this coloration, particularly in these three projects of Stam, Taut and Le Corbusier, were described by the press as orgies of colour. This is an expression repeatedly used. Uh, and they were repeatedly attacked during the heated controversy about the exhibition. Uh, since the controversy was dominated by Le Corbusier's houses and what he said about them, uh, particularly his claim that the house is a dwelling machine, a uh, claim that, of course, he, he in fact uh, quickly withdrew or, or, or clarified in later uh, arguments became, of course, one of the standard expressions associated with him. And, of course, he in turn had picked that expression up from other people. But nevertheless, that claim in this moment of time uh, drove the press uh, crazy. Uh, and it's not surprising then, given this emphasis on his project, that the issue of colour and the debate about colour turned on the relative merits of his and Tout's colour scheme. So there was a long uh, battle that was staged uh, uh, in the press about whether, whether Tad had gone too far, whether Le Corbusier had also gone too far, or whether Le Corbusier was just right and Tad had gone too far. The, the only thing that's shared by all the people in this debate was that Tad had gone too far. Right? And he was trashed all around. Now you have to remember, and probably you do, that Tad had long been an activist for coloured architecture. Already in 1905, his private journal argues that he will in the future, quote, unify uh, what he then called his painterly concern with colour and his architectural abilities. There was a moment in his career where he didn't know whether he'd become a painter or an architect. In fact, the moment he decides to become an architect is the moment he decides that he can move his concern with colour from painting to architecture. And this is a move made by, of course, as you probably know, uh, a significant number of the so-called pioneers of modern architecture who began as painters. Uh, he wanted to produce, as his journal said, spatial composition with colour, coloured architecture. In, and in the, in the very fo following year, he used his very first commission for a church renovation to produce a multicoloured interior. Indeed, he rethinks architecture in, in terms of painting to such an extent that he describes his uh, multicoloured housing estate at Falkenberg. Um, uh, this is, of course, a different project. This is the Horseshoe project of... Uh, 1925-27, but again, just to give you a sense of the kind of coloration we're, we're talking about. Uh, but anyway, getting back to the, back in time a little bit to the Falkenberg project, which is out there on the left, 1912-14, he describes this project as a picture. I mean, the, the language that he uses is a painterly language, which, as he puts it, has been enlivened by an extremely vivacious and at times intensive application of color. 
right? So he conceives of the whole project uh, as a colored painting. It's pink, olive green, golden brown, and blue surfaces, of course, uh, aroused enormous opposition, to which he replied that he was simply recovering the ancient tradition of polychromy. Now, the manifesto for this recovery of color was, of, was the infamous glass house that he constructed with Franz Hoffmann for the 1914 Workbund uh, Congress at Cologne, uh, a building which embodied Paul Schubert's idealistic accounts of an architecture of pure color. Its spaces were quite literally conceived of as color chambers in which the visitor would be suspended in the colored light coming through, uh, the streaming through the stained glass walls. To progress through the space was to progress through different colors. While the focus of attention at the Congress, uh, as is so famously uh, described, was an intense struggle over the issue of standardization versus artistic freedom, by 1919, Tout was able to get all the architects together from each of the bickering groups within the Werkbund to countersign his call for colorful uh, building. And this is an astonishing achievement. Uh, you have to understand that everybody disagreed with everybody at that moment. That's in fact what constituted them as a group was the intensity of their disagreement. Uh, it is what, exactly what they shared and they would regularly break down into different groups, different organizations and collaborations and so on. The only thing they were all able to put their name to was a short call for colorful uh, uh, building. And it, within this group of people uh, is included most of the figures that you know of that would become uh, uh, influential in the historiography of modern architecture and their work ranged even at that time but certainly later from what would now be uh, somewhat dangerously described as expressionist work to work that would also be equally dangerously described as functionalist and in fact what's interesting about the theory of color at that moment is it renders the distinction between expressionist and functionalist uh, uh, irrelevant or, uh, if not uh, stupid and stupidity as you probably know is usually successful um, and uh, one of the successful uh, distinctions that between expressionist and functionalist uh, uh, is one of the things that we, you have to deal with when dealing with the issue of color and the white wall. Now what linked these fantasies was of course the color and in fact it's pretty easy to demonstrate that the functionalist schemes and certainly this is true of Taub but it's also true of a number of the other architects were a strict development of the expressionist ones rather than so-called expressionist ones rather than uh, a break uh, uh, with from them. When Taut became the city architect of uh, Magdeburg, for instance, in 1921, so keep in mind, this is now, or, or this is six years before the Weisenhof, he described his attempt to cover the whole city in a polychrome skin in terms of rational choices, insisting, uh, for example, and maybe just to give you just the, a, a, an idea of the kind of drawings he was doing at that time, and I, sho I chose these particular two simply because the uh, drawing on the right, which is uh, I think from around 1930-31, and the drawing on the left, represent the shift that's going on uh, in his own work um, from, from work kind of that is traditionally tied earlier in his career to work that's traditionally tied later. And what they share is this, is this colored skin. It's the skin that, that, that drives the projects, in fact. But when describing um, his project in 1921, he describes the choice of each color in terms of rational choices, insisting that he takes detailed account of the specific lighting conditions in each location of the project and chooses each color to, as he puts it, underline the spatial character of the development. Likewise, he describes the layout of his 1930 housing estate, the Zeelandhof housing. You see there on the left is the colored plan. You probably can't read it from afar, but on the top right is just a small color key which just designates which of the colors is to go on the outside of the buildings and the result you see on the right. Now when he describes this, he says the layout is, quote, supported and emphasized. Uh, and the, the language is important here, the idea that color can support. I mean, a, 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 a term that we always use to, des to describe a kind of architectural function. Here, the very condition of architecture is, uh, is propped up on the color, is supported and emphasized by them. And his use of colors as he puts it, permits the spatial layout to be expanded in certain directions and contracted in others. In other words, when he applies the color, the color changes the architecture. He can move around the walls, he can change the sense of the space, and so on. He operates with color simply as an architect. Well, I guess it's not simple to operate as an architect, but it's the same thing for him.
After detailing the specific effects of color in terms of what he called controlled rhythms of passivity and activity, so again, very similar arguments that were used relative to the, uh, to the glass house, that he could control the rhythm of color and produce a kind of sensuous uh, psychological uh, transformation, a, a psychological transformation produced by a sensuous transformation uh, in the building. He argues again that these distinctions are supplemented by the architectural groupings of the form. So what's happened here now is that color is what he's de designing primarily and the architecture is the supplement to the color. Right? So what we would typically think of as colored architecture is architecture which has ha somehow been reinforced or corrected by the color. But he's gone one crucial step further which is to say that the color is the architecture which has just been as it were supported and sometimes interfered with by the forms. Uh, and sometimes architects cannot control the forms. Uh, color then returns the control to them, which may be lost due to political process or constrictions of the site, and so on and so on. So color has been transformed in his mind from a ba into a basic element of rational city planning. And you have to remember that Bruno Taut was a model uh, of, if, if people produce fantasies about what a rationalist or functionalist architecture would be, Bruno Taut was one of the architects that most fully uh, fitted into that model in terms of efficiency, organization, uh, communication, social functions, and so on. He played it by the rules. Uh, so you have to remember that this very person who's, whose color is being trashed as irresponsible and out of control is in fact a figure of control uh, in terms of the more classical, let's say, white image of modern architecture. When he's describing this uh, project, for instance, uh, he says the role of color is physical. When, when describing the project, he says it's just as impossible to exclude color from the process of construction as it would be to exclude the bricks of a wall or the iron and concrete of a, of a structural skeleton. The use of color must be just as logical and consistent as the use of any other building material. Now, it's crucial to note that while he's calling for a rational use of color, he specifically argued that there would be no such thing as a general theory of color. He argued that each site-specific condition was so specific that it would obliterate the thought that there could be any overall rational theory of how color would work. You simply had to do it in situ and calculate and on the basis of experience produce in each site a different uh, operation. To give you a sense of, of how one of those operations worked, a quite extraordinary book uh, which was published in the same year as the Weizenhof Siedling, this Ein Wohnhaus of 1927. You see at the back of the book there's a fold-out uh, uh, color chart and that's used to designate all of the colors of the spaces. If you take the image on the right, it's the frontispiece. So it's the only actual colored photograph inside the book. And on the left, you see the corresponding page from the book, in which it's maybe a little hard for you to read, but uh, for instance, there's A on this wall, which corresponds to A at the top of the chart, which corresponds to that wall there. Um, and right through the book, every single part of the building is specified in terms of its uh, uh, color. But again, to put this into context, this is an astonishing book. I think it's one of the most detailed analyses of a building by an architect produced during that time. This is an analysis of, of his own house, in fact. And he details everything about it. It's energy saving functions, it's plumbing. It's gone, there are plumbing diagrams in great detail. You'll see even the plumbing is color coded that yellow as it goes over the door. There are numerous analytical drawings. There are photographs of the house in operation and so on. It's a sort of virtuoso, virtuoso performance in terms of a sort of self-analysis by an architect, all of it in functional terms. Right? So color here has to be understood uh, uh, as, 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 as rational. And in fact, uh, it, it color becomes almost the proof, the precision of his use of color becomes the proof of the fact that he's absolutely committed to, to uh, a theory of, of functional efficiency and uh, redistribution of resources and so on. There's, of course, a political argument that falls out of that. The only reason I insist on this, of course, is precisely because so much of the labor of the historiography has been to render figures like Tout uh, a suspect precisely by virtue of their use of color, their refusal in certain cases of general theories of construction, certain eccentricities, and so on. So again, I say this only to say that if that's the game you want to play, if you want to talk about functional architecture, then uh, in fact you cannot uh, um, remove this player from the field. On the contrary, most of the other architects disappear off the map before this person. And this was understood at the time of the Weisenhof Siedlung. When his colors were dismissed, his other housing projects were repeatedly used as evidence for the fact that while 
the Weisenhof Siedling pretended to be a functionalist architecture. In fact, real functionalist architecture was to be found in Bruno Taut's uh, housing scheme. So again, there is a sophistication to the discussion at that time which is somewhat lacking um, in the years since. Anyway, back to Le Corbusier. Remember, we are discussing the uh, um, conflict between them. I'm sure you know uh, that Le Corbusier was into colour. Uh, two examples, both of which you know very well. Again, both of them impressed on us all um, slightly after birth in, in architecture schools. Um, but how, how is it that we look at these images? Just two uh, um, well-known images, I guess. Uh, how do we know what this colour means? What do we think of this when we look at it? Um, you know, just because we know them and just because we know that they're coloured doesn't mean we really acknowledge that they're coloured. Right? And again, uh, I don't want to play the pop shrink on you. Um, if anybody's to be shrunk, it's me. Um, but something is going on. Right? We don't see this colour. And the evidence for that fact is that even the people who use these images, even the texts that surround these images in the books that I've taken them from, even in the moment when they describe that colour, have ways of bracketing it, bracketing it away from their argument. And this is a very curious phenomenon and requires a kind of intellectual agility that took years to produce, and my interest is in how that was produced, how it is that we're all able to play this little trick that we can think of Le Corbusier first as white and then maybe as coloured, but we keep the white image there uh, 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 in, perfect, in, in, in clarity. Let, let's to put it another way, if we were to colour this room with those colours, people are not going to walk in here and go, oh, look at Bouzier. right? But with this white, you know, they might look at some of the round columns and say, oh, well, you know, with a little bit of work we could make this happen. Right? So how is that possible for us to, to, to do that? Well, I suppose one of the reasons that we think that's possible is that in 1925, Le Corbusier published that extraordinary book, The Decorative Art of Today, uh, in which l is an argument that, of course, trashes decoration in general and leads up to a chapter on the so-called law of, of whitewash or the law of repelin, which is the sort of white uh, uh, finish used in France at that time, which calls for a totally white architecture. So that we, we might have reason to think that there is a white moment in Le Corbusier's work followed by a coloured phase and therefore we are, it's appropriate for us to privilege the white uh, over the colour. But in fact, it's simply not the case that Le Corbusier called for a totalising regime of white in 1925 and he's insisting, I mean it's really a regime, in fact he, he suggested that the police should be called in to whiten all the buildings of Paris and that would be, as he puts it, a kind of moral, ethical uh, act. In fact, when he makes the argument about white walls, he insists that all of the values, ethical, functional, technological, social, psychological and so on, of modern architecture would hang on the whiteness of its walls. Right? Um, now it's not that he just then so somehow changes his mind. Even the infamous uh, L'Esprit Nouveau Pavilion on the left of 1925, whose exhibition, The Decorative Art of Today, was timed to coincide with, had a striking colour scheme. Far from the white box that appears in photographs, and again I've just chosen the one, that's the standard photograph, uh, this building was covered with white, black, light grey, dark grey, yellow ochre, pale yellow ochre, burnt sienna, dark burnt sienna and light blue surfaces. So what's strange here is in 1925 the proclamation of the law of Repelin, which insists that everything should be white, is somehow strangely paralleled by the very application of coloured surfaces that it appears to ban. In fact, the practical use of colour preceded its theoretical rejection uh, in favour of white. And I'll try and demonstrate this just by talking about this project here on the right. Um, it's true that the first projects with which Le Corbusier appeared to abandon his commitment to the decorative arts, which is to say the first projects in which he claims to have rejected his own background, which as you can understand is a background in uh, craft tradition. It's also, and very significantly for us tonight, a background in colour. Now it's true that all of the early projects working on the concept of the domino, which would, which would of course become so crucial in his representation of himself, it's true that those were all sketched as white. What's perhaps less well known uh, is that there was only one white building uh, that he ever did. And this is the one on the right here. And even that is a little bit, uh, one has to be cautious about it. This is the Villa, Villa Besnou at uh, Vaucresson. 
which he started to design with Genere in uh, 1923. And of course, when I say Genere, he, he of course had kicked out his own name of Genere precisely in, or in the attempt to get rid of all that color uh, and decorative arts work of his youth. So in this moment where he declares himself, as it were, reborn as Le Corbusier, uh, this was a polemically white uh, project. If you look at the elevation on the right, even the window glass is rendered white such that what, what the project, uh, as are the doors of the garage, or garage and so on, uh, even the wall, which is by virtue of the shadow in front of the building, is somehow rendered in a way in which it starts to collapse back so that you get the effect of a single continuous white surface of, which is just lightly uh, punctuated by the window mullions and details of entrances uh, and so on. And this was indeed the polemic. The fact that those windows are white is not just a... Uh, uh, convention. In fact, it's easy to demonstrate that other conventions were available to him and he was using. It was the polemic of the project itself. Again, uh, you see here the, the uh, model on the left uh, as published in L'Architecture Vivant. And again, you notice that the, window, the windows have been rendered in white. They have been rendered in the same material uh, as the rest of the building. And this is also true of models that he had, and this is a model that was exhibited in Paris. It's true of other models that he had exhibited, the very models that were responsible get for him getting this commission. But you see there the uh, quality of the elevation on the left as it moves with into with the plans uh, and sections is maintained uh, uh, in, in, in the model. Furthermore, when the building is finally constructed, uh, he carefully closes the uh, curtains retouches, as you see, the window up on the right to make it white again. In fact, probably it's uh, even more interesting because it ends up more white than the building itself. And retouches the left-hand side of the image uh, to produce the same kind of effect. The glass which is over the entrance is already opaque. And the effect of this, of, as you can see on the window on the, uh, on the middle of the building, but on the far right, you see again just the effect of the closed curtains produces exactly the same effect of, of opaque uh, glass. So it would be correct, I think, to say that this building is an essay on white. Um, that's the role of the building. And interestingly enough, and in a lot of his texts, Le Corbusier pretends that this is the first project that he ever did. Uh, he claims that it's the project in which he invented the free plan, uh, and, and of course, so in the very moment that he suppresses all of his earlier coloured work, um, which of course includes an, a, a large number of houses, projects, designs, details, drawings and studies and so on, in colour, in this moment he produces uh, the all-white building, but it's the only all-white building. In the summer of 1924, uh, just to give you a sense of the interior, this images, both again images that he published. Uh, in 1924, um, before he'd completed any other buildings, color suddenly returned to his work. In the late stages of the construction of the Aux Enfants Atelier in, in Paris, again, just pushing old uh, images at you. The architect sent the builder a color scheme for the interior walls which specified that the entrance would be ultramarine, the ground floor kitchen in green and burnt sienna and the gatekeeper's room and toilet in light pink. Uh, there could be a book on pink in, in uh, modern architecture. Um, on the mezzanine floor there was a kitchen in green and burnt sienna, the museum in terra umber, the bedroom in uh, the reason I keep saying that thing about pink because pink would be probably the one color that would be most problematic in terms of the tradition I'm talking about. There's a whole series of uh, reasons that one could speculate about that. Anyway, on the mezzanine, kitchen, green and burnt sienna, museum and terra umber, bedroom and dressing room and red panelling, gal gallery and green and terra umber, on top floor, library and terra umber. Now at the same time, the very same time, the surfaces of the housing scheme at Pesac and the, the Villa La Roche Genere were systematically coloured on similar lines. Constructed shortly afterwards, the Lusprinovo Pavilion, as I showed it to you before, merely continued this polemical experiment with the same set of colors. But intriguingly, that use of color is not accounted for in the series of four books that, as Le Corbusier later put it, compromi uh, <laughs> comprised the theory of which the pavilion was intended to be but the realization. But of course, they do compromise uh, the project um, and the th because they don't mention the color that's so clearly part of the project. The books are, of course, Towards an Architecture of 23, Modern Painting 25, Urbanism 25, and Decorative Art of Today 1925 also. In fact, it's not until the following year that he starts to account for the color scheme of this pavilion, and he does so only lightly in the Olmec Architecture Moderne, in which the captions to the images, the same image that I showed you before, 
uh, describe the color of each surface while the text briefly describes the thinking behind the choice of colors before announcing some kind of distance from the totalizing theory of white that had been presented the year before when he says entirely white, the house is like a cream jug. So we, we appear finally at the level of theory to get a confirmation of the shift from white to color that we know occurred in the work. Le Corbusier has finally begun to account for his colored paint two years after he started applying it. Even then, he does not offer a theory of colored architecture, just a set of hints about such how such a theory might be elaborated and a rejection of the all-white building. An old theory appears to be abandoned without a new one being adopted as such. Even more interesting, he uses the law of Reeperlin in 25 to ban color a year after he started to use color. So his call for the police to come in and get rid of all the color becomes kind of weird, pathological, I would suggest, obviously, uh, since he so polemically used it in such a public place. Nothing could be more public, and that was, of course, his dream to publicize himself in, in the uh, exhibition of 25. Now, of course, uh, these books are coming mainly out of articles uh, produced for L'Esprit Nouveau, and the almanac was intended to be an issue of L'Esprit Nouveau, and in fact, the manuscripts for approving of color and disapproving of color were both written in 1925. The chapter on whitewash uh, is, in fact, the uh, published in the 25 book, is, uh, is, is the only part of that book that was not originally published before. It's produced exactly in the same year. So in exactly the same moment that he writes his little defense of the use of color is the moment in which he writes the uh, attack on color. Uh, and we can be more precise about this in as much as the chapter on Reeperlin, on the whitewash, ends uh, with an image of the interior of the, uh, of the Ozenhan Atelier. Oh, I was going to show you this one. When he does the Oeuvre Complete in, in 29, if you didn't buy, buy my uh, suggestion that this is an essay on whiteness, he does a new elevation for the building. Right? This is, again, a uh, long time after the construction of the building. And it's, a, it's, a, it's a wash drawing in which that whiteness has been made even more polemical. In other words, it, 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 this, and again, probably it's quite nice to show you this image at this moment because now you, you, you see the image knowing knowing that he's a full-on polemical colorist at this moment in time and has been for some years. And he's producing this kind of uh, a drawing. Again, uh, a pathology, a strange pathology, which we have uh, uh, taken inside of us all too easily and eagerly. Okay, this is, the of course, the standard interior. It's the only image of, of an architectural project which appears in the uh, decorative art of today until 1959, I think it is. He adds a new preface where he shows... Uh, pictures of a L'Esprit Nouveau pavilion. What's interesting about this uh, image, of course, is that it tends to blast out any sense of color here. Um, you don't see the colors that are on the, uh, on the sills of the windows. You have a sense that the, most of the window mullions are painted white except for those panels which open, the opening parts of the window. But even the floor, which is somehow obviously not white, is, is blasted with the light from the sun so that it starts to become, in fact, even whiter than uh, uh, the walls. And this image assumes a kind of uh, 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 intense, it becomes an image of a white uh, uh, box. Most people, this, this, is a, this is a room, in fact, that's many, many times been referred to as a kind of the, the inside of a white uh, prism. Uh, when people like Vincent Scully write about this image uh, or about this project, they or virtually go orgasmic over the whiteness of it. Uh, I suggest you look at Scully's passages in um, his slim uh, uh, modern architecture book. It's slim and brief, but then it hesitates for a moment. In the moment of brevity, it hesitates at this image. He goes completely crazy about its whiteness. But you can already tell, again, strangely, it's somehow not white. Furthermore, it appears in the book exactly opposite the claim that what's great about white is that it reveals the color of anything you put in front of it. So what we can say of this image is that the particular image being chosen here conceals what the whiteness it presents is supposed to reveal. For instance, let's say the colorations of the Ozenfond painting, which you see in the distance. This is an image that effaces the fact that Le Corbusier insists that buildings can only scrutinize the color of any object they frame by being completely white at the very moment that he's already started to apply color to his own buildings. Now, a completely different effect could have been uh, produced with different images of the same project. And again, I'll show you this is another image of the Ozenfond Atelier. This one published in 1925 in L'Architecture uh, Vivante. 
which shows you the spiral staircase through which the visitor passes in order to get from the white exterior of this building to the white, somewhat white, studio space you see on the left. Now you can tell from this image that the staircase is white, it's also white, but you can also see that it's not hermetically sealed off from this somewhat more colorful space. In fact, quite deliberately what's happened here is that even though you don't physically enter this room, you pass up through this space. You, to get to the studio you are forced to, as it were, twist your way up through the colored space. To, so to go from white to white, you have to spin through color and the, the spiral, as it were, uh, uh, spins you round these colors and forces you to appreciate the relationship between the colors on the painting and the relationship of the room. Uh, in effect, that's not the same as the image on the left. And in fact, if we are more precise about that, this journey up through the spiral, in fact, begins in the ultramarine entrance lobby and ends with the Terra Umbra library, which is suspended within the studio space. So at least we can say at this point that the relationship between white and color is incredibly convoluted. The white might be dominant in this building, but it can never be separated from the colors. Nevertheless, interestingly enough, that image on the right was promptly withdrawn from circulation. In fact, it appeared in, 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 uh, uh, in 1925, it appeared in a number of the major magazines, but then dis virtually disappeared, almost never seen again. So again, it didn't fit in with uh, a, a certain image, uh, an image that had yet be to be constructed, which is why you're allowed to see this image uh, at this point. Now, the primacy of color for Le Corbusier uh, is so obvious that it's alarming. Again, just to take you back to paintings from 1907 of Le Corbusier. Not only are many of his architectural drawings colored, but many of his black ink or pencil sketches are annotated with color references. He even attempted to resist the color blindness of black and white photography by publishing hand colored images of Pesach. You see there. Villa La Roche, the artist's house at Bologna, Villa Cook, and so on, in the 1927 issue of L'Architecture Vivant, and he did the same thing with the Pavilion uh, de Nouveau Temps uh, later. Again, just to show you, again, images that you must have seen many times. Um, he, he was um, very embarrassed about the particular effect of these colors and wrote to many of his friends saying, don't, don't take these colors seriously. That's a problem with the sort of production techniques. But what's interesting here is the attempt to produce uh, the image of color and the Earth Complet uh, started to use color when color printing arrived. And in fact, the last the posthum posthumous volume uses many color illustrations too, as his publisher puts it, honor his understanding of polychrome as an essential expressive element of his architecture. So it's not simply a question of the color of his uh, buildings. Uh, we must note also that one of the subtexts of his writing is its obsessive attention to color details. Not by chance does he seemingly go out of his way, for instance, to point out that the fence that was originally put up by the authorities to conceal his Le Smyrie Nouveau pavilion was green. Like when he's telling us going on and on about the crime it was of their attempt to conceal it, uh, this fence which in the end was not uh, to be there, he's still telling us that it was a green fence. And this is always the case with him. When he publishes his lectures, for instance, he often tells the reader the color of each of the lines that he drew for the audience. Symptomatically, the notes from which the lectures are made have these colors uh, pre-marked on them. Again, these are from a lecture in Milan. Uh, so it's all very, very uh, calculated, and eventually this will be formalized when the mental architecture, as he puts it, of the escoral grid for CM is color-coded. And he speaks of the advantages of using color as a medium of communication since, as he puts it, the eye is guided by color signals to certain points of interest, while he acknowledges at that, in that same text that, that color is really expensive to do in terms of production and for publication. And it's not, furthermore, that color is an abstract code for him. Particular concepts are associated with particular colors. When describing, for example, the use of one color rather than another while drawing during a lecture, he points out that, quote, it is useless to try and make colors say the contrary of what one means. Uh, indeed, throughout his career, conceptual drawings are almost always color-coded. Color is a conceptual issue long before it's theorized as such. It's a mechanism of classification. It's a way of thinking rather than a way of marking particular thoughts. In his, if I had to teach you architecture of 38, he advises students, quote, here is a golden rule, use colored pencils. With color you accentuate, you classify, you clarify, you disentangle. With black pencil you get stuck in the mud and you're lost. Always say to yourself, drawings must e be easy to read, color will come to the rescue. 
in the end, then, color is much more than a means of communicating architectural ideas. It's a part of the technical means of producing architecture and part of its fundamental condition. For Le Corbusier, architecture is literally shaped by the colors it emerges out of. The question of color is the question of architecture itself. Before anything else, the architect must be a color expert. And Le Corbusier demonstrated this expertise uh, when he produced, uh, on the left here, 1932, a uh, color chart for Salubra, Swiss wallpaper company, which he updated, as you see uh, in the image on the right. Uh, and this was a kind of complex uh, color scheme. And the idea was that if you couldn't afford Le Corbusier as an architect, you could certainly afford his uh, wallpaper. And designers and their clients were encouraged to use this chart to select matching wallpapers from the special edition that carried his name. And of course, in this way, these are advertisements from uh, Zodiac uh, magazine. Uh, in this way, the architect's signature could be applied to a space that he had not designed through the simple choice of particular colors, just as it could through the purchase of his furniture. By marketing the skin of buildings, Le Corbusier had returned to the world of interior decoration from which he had so dramatically staged his departure 20 years earlier. His original campaign against the applied surface of wallpaper was continued by taking over that very surface. The colored surface is not simply stripped off the wall and abandoned. Rather, the architect has entered the surface and attempted to control it, turning it into an agent of modernization by disciplining it against its own excesses, steering it away from the ancient but omnipresent dangers of ornament. Um, in case you've forgotten a crime. Le Corbusier appropriates the very technology of decoration to depower decoration. Uh, now, to understand this uh, um, particular, I mean, the, the polemical and even financial, commercial nature of this relationship with color, you have to go back, I think, to look at the uh, Voyage to the Orient, of course, the well-known book, the first book that he wrote, even though it was not uh, submitted for publication until uh, very, uh, you know, a few weeks before his death, in fact, in 65. And uh, this is precisely the moment in which I had the feeling we could talk in detail, but I think we're going to run out of time, so I'm going to sort of skate through this book. But just to give you a little bit of a sense of what it would be to read this book, as it were, looking back for clues as to exactly what is the relationship between white and color for this architect. Now, the book, of course, as you know, is a record of the five-month tour that Le Corbusier took with his Swiss friend, Auguste Klipstein, between 1910 and 1911. It's the logbook of a, of a uh, tourist, which describes the various images presented to a traveling eye. Now, what it, for me is so striking about this book is that Le Corbusier relentlessly reports the color of all of the surfaces that he sees. It is as if the specificity of each point in the itinerary is marked by the particular colors. Even the sketches he did at the time are carefully annotated with the matching colors and aligning themselves with a set of watercolors that he also prepared. I'll give you two examples of uh, these kind of watercolors. And indeed, at one point, the book refers to itself as a colored painting. He several times refers to the book as a kind of painting, a colored painting. Now, the implication of this travel log is not just that generic forms have been coded with regional color schemes. The colors are seen to be integral to what they mark. And he endlessly insists on this fact that indigenous cultures that he, as he quote, quote puts it, discovers, uh, use color in a way that accentuates the form that they use. And he keeps insisting on the central nature of that, of that uh, uh, coloration. And in fact, he describes his own journey as one of, as he puts it, unrestrained debauchery, um, which, you know, it may have been, but the reason, the reason that it's, he's saying that it's unrestrained debauchery is merely by virtue of the fact that he was continually looking at the colors. That's what made it uh, uh, so scandalous, was that he was always searching for the authentic folk object and the coloration of that object. Now, of course, color is always associated with sensuality, but if you read the text, uh, and not even carefully, just read it at face value, which is how, of course, all text should be read. On the face, on the surface of this text, he insists that sensuality is itself uh, the very means, the kind of coloration used is the very means of attaining a kind of higher order. Uh, repeatedly, he describes the fact that color in the architectures that he sees are what he calls the healthy base of the achievement of a higher, more abstract uh, vision. 
In fact, he says that the, the coloration of these objects produces the rational eye, the eye that is able to uh, uh, discriminate. And again and again, this is a highly sexualized vocabulary he uses. For instance, when talking about uh, the coloration on um, peasant artwork, he says, thus this traditional art, like a lingering warm caress, embraces the entire land, covering it with the same flowers that unite or mingle races, climates, and places. It is spread without constraint with the spiritedness of a beautiful animal. The forms are voluminous and swollen with vitality. The line continually unites and mingles native scenes or offers right alongside and on the same object the magic of geometry, an astonishing union of fundamental instincts and of those susceptible to more abstract speculations. So for him, more than an object to be caressed, the artwork is itself a caress, a warm caress, as he puts it, that exceeds any attempt to control it. The detached modern eye is a product of the traditional sensuality that it appears to have left behind and is constantly dislodged or challenged by that sensuality, confused whenever it looks back, set adrift in the very moment that it tries to master materiality. Voyage to the Orient offers a sensuous account of the would-be architect endlessly drifting through colored spaces in a state of what he calls fever, intoxication, or dream. The tour through the East is a tour from color to color, with the traveler being physically led by the colors, dragged through the spaces they define as if in some kind of trance. From the decorative pattern on a utilitarian folk vase to the explosion, as he puts it, of color in the, quote, insane and purposeless excesses of a street festival, where dance becomes uh, the possibility for, as he puts it, confusing the eye, perturbing it, as he says, by the kaleidoscopic cinema where dance the most dizzying combinations of colors. These are his concerns. Everywhere the traveler is repeatedly dislodged by what he sees. Le Corbusier's celebration of actually being drunk or feverish in certain places of the text, I mean there are long discussions of his, uh, how much he was drinking and when he was sick, um, these become, in fact, emblematic of the ho whole tour. They don't become, they're not registered in the text as, as sort of incidents, like everything was going fine and then I had a hangover. It was the hangover and the feeling of the hangover that explains and, and uh, exemplifies his feeling through the whole uh, uh, journey. In fact, this translite state is intensified by the sun's movements, according to him, that change the quality of every space, mobilizing every surface, modifying every color. The text is obsessed with light and its effect on color. The light is itself a physical presence able to, as he puts it, invade at one point or pierce at one point or annihilate at another point spaces and the distinctions between them through its quasi-erotic charge. It's a kind of body such that the traveler can find himself nestled, as he puts it, under the warm belly of the white sky. And Billings can, as he puts it in another place, receive its warm caress, the caress of the light. The encounter between building and light which he would insist on through his whole career, is always sexual. To occupy a space is to be caressed by surfaces that are able to caress because they themselves have been caressed by the light. Uh, the building actively positions itself to receive such caresses and pass them on. Kind of a friend, uh, very good friend, intimate friend. The experience of architecture indeed becomes that of a menage a trois in which the most active partners, and certainly the most ambivalent in terms of gender, are the building and the light. The, the so-called masterly, masterly play of forms and light uh, is erotic. Yet it is only masterly inasmuch as its successes are controlled, regulated by an architect so that the observer of a building can preserve a stable identity. The architect shelters the occupant of a building psychologically from the ambivalence of the physical shelter itself. So, while white paint is clearly a key agent of this st stabilizing mastery, it too participates in the sexual economy that it supposedly regulates. And it is this, to skip many steps in, in, in uh, what should be a much slower argument, it is the sensuality of white that I'm insisting on here. It is that quality uh, which is always effaced in the name of certain ideas about abstraction or neutrality or silence. It is the sensuality of, of white and Le Corbusier's stated experience of that that is uh, of interest to me. And here we are focusing only on Le Corbusier because of course he's just a, such a fantastic array of symptoms uh, and it's very, very helpful to then go, having looked at his pathology, to then look at the different but related pathologies of many of the people that he was engaging with. In a way, Le Corbusier, it's just too easy. It's just too easy to read this book and see what's being said. Anyway, 
The voyage to the Orient's privilege of the sensuous encounter with surfaces is not simply abandoned when the decorative art of today uh, senses color along with all the other forms of sensuous decoration in favor of a regime of white. Not by chance does the decorative art of today end by describing the long journey to the East as decisive because, as he puts it, it finally shattered his, quote, respect for decoration that had been fostered by his training. Indeed, the book's whole argument is embedded within the early travel log. Voyage to the Orient already makes the call for a purification in the age of what he calls an infectious germ of gold-colored bric-a-brac that will become the battle cry uh, of his 20s uh, work and writings. And White plays a unique role within the text's blurry dream. The haze of color that he's talking about is always punctuated by white surfaces. This is already evident in the first description of the sensuous encounter with an authentic folk object. And again, I, I give you this extra quote just because maybe you don't buy this claim that uh, it's all about sex. You recognize these joys, to feel the generous belly of a vase, to caress its slender neck, and then to explore the subtleties of its contours, to thrust your hands into the deepest part of your pockets, and with your eyes half closed, to give way slowly to the intoxication of the fantastic glazes, the burst of yellow, the velvet tone of the blues, to be involved in the animated fight between brutal black and victorious white elements. So, um, it's the victory of white that somehow releases the sensuous colors that will close down the very eyes that look at them in favor of an intimate embrace. It is white that maintains the fragile economy in which visuality is blurred with sensuality. It is white that allows the eyes to flutter, half closed, half open. Indeed, the rest of the text is entirely, I would say, because this is a problem of my obsession, the text is itself obsessed with whiteness. It speaks of the whiteness of the ship on which the tourists travel, the white stucco of peasant houses, the white mosques, the white sand, the white reflections on the water, the white sky, the white oarsman's cap, the white paving stones, the white curbstone of a well, the white hall of a monastery, the white bubble, uh, marble bust, the white table, the white minarets, the white fabrics, the white room, the white carriages, the white trellis, the right, white, there's no difference between right and white, white coat of the toll taker, the white glass, the white wooden benches, the white turbans, the white mist, the white poppies, the white morning light, the white stars, the white sun, the white cap of the oarsman, the white lighthouse, and so on. Now this ubiquitous whiteness, which is variously described as brilliant, bare, raw, naive, impassive, icy, blinding, shiny, and majestic, is a crucial part of the dreamy journey. Indeed, it somehow acts as the figure for the dreamlike nature of the journey, as when Le Corbusier describes his ship passing through a fog in which the sky cannot be distinguished from the sea. He says, like a white ghost, our boat floats in an elusive element. It is the white that enables the passage through the blur. Yet the white is not simply detached from the haze through which it negotiates. Even white buildings in the blazing sun are credited with what he calls an icy mystery that is related to the mysterious relationships of form and color, as he puts it, that he finds in the white monasteries on top of Mount Athos. In fact, it's these uh, buildings he's talking about here on the left, or these are the buildings related to the monasteries. This is a, a painting from Mount Athos. The whitewashed room of the particular monastery where he stayed, for example, is intensified, he argues, by the rug on the floor which is blooming with colors and on which he chose to sleep. And in fact, he bought the rug and then took it with him for the rest of the trip. Indeed, the very intensity of the white blurs the distinction between it and the sensuality of the colors that offset it. It is here at Athos that the text speaks of the way that, quote, the glaring presence of a white sun confuses one's sense of color. And it is precisely on this mountain, this, as he puts it, tremendous pyramid covered with white marble, that he clarifies his search for the, quote, millennial form to be found all over the world. And it's here that he has his most extreme, if not kind of... Uh, uh, hallucinogenic fantasy about color. Uh, he says, to go even further, I imagine color in bands of yellows, reds, blues, violets, and greens with sharp boundaries, but otherwise like a rainbow of lines going from the vertical to the horizontal without the bisecting slope. Let rhythm alone arrange this pure graphic expression. Um, and he, you know, this is, he, he in fact was um, a little bit with a fever when he was on Athos. Um, anyway. <laughs> Uh, it just fits in uh, to, to what it is that he's talking about. 
in a way, he's looking for a fever. There are also several moments in the text where, where he's unhappy with an area. He's unhappy with the loss of this trance-like uh, uh, feeling. Now, just to quickly make a few points and try, try to get out of this um, book in which one could spend uh, several nights. Uh, it's important to note that, th that, that this book never talks about white without talking about color. Right? They always go together. So it's just impossible to separate them. Um, for instance, when talking about peasant houses through Serbia, Bulgaria, Constantinople, and Athens, he says, each spring, the house that one loves receives its new coat, sparkling white. It smiles the whole summer through foliage and flowers that owe it to their dazzle. Owe to it their dazzle. The rooms are whitewashed, and the white is so beautiful that I was very impressed. Already last year I had become enthused over the decorative power that people and things take on when seen against the white of peasant rooms. So what's interesting here is he makes a double argument that color is more like color when it's with white and white is more like white when it's with color. They're a team, a kind of uh, happy couple if you believe in that uh, possibility. Okay, the white at once brightens the colors that appear against it and renders them uh, decorative. Okay? So this is the basic uh, uh, story of the argument and one can go on and on elaborating that. Um, when he talks, for instance, about the Parthenon, the Parthenon which will of course become the central figure, the kind of point of authority on which he will rest so many of his claims. When he's talking about the Parthenon, what he's exhilarated by in this text is the way it changes color depending on the day, the light, and so on. And he has another of his LSD descriptions of the way this thing can go from white to black and so on. And one could again look at the drawings that he did which exactly match uh, uh, this argument. Now, suffice to say that this delirium, which is clearly what it is, in fact, when he describes the Parthenon, he, he moves it into a more orgasmic phase. And of course, it's consistent with the fact that he presents the Parthenon as the kind of climax uh, of this whole book. That finally here he finds uh, architecture and says, never in my life have I experienced the subtleties of such monochromy. Right? The body, the mind, the heart gasp suddenly overpowered. It's the capacity of the Parthenon to keep taking on different colors and each one, one color that fascinates him. Right? So it's the monochromy, the shift from monochromy to monochromy that operates this way. Um, now this sort of orgasmic delirium in the face of white and the capacity of white to become not white is of course completely suppressed by the decorative art of today when it makes its seemingly puritanical call for white to eliminate sensuality. The sensuality of white itself seems to be effaced from his theory until he starts to uh, uh, embrace color in the almanac, uh, which symptomatically publishes the very sections of the Journey to the East uh, which deal with the white mosques and the Parthenon. It would seem that for Le Corbusier it takes color to bring out the sensuality of white. The white surface does not simply regulate the delirium of color by excluding it, rather it absorbs that delirium in a way that makes available something supposedly uh, beyond it but not simply uh, detached from it. And again, one could, one could quickly do a history and figure out where all this came from in terms of his uh, theories of color written with uh, 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 Ozenfant in the, essay, the key essay on purism of 1920 and so on and so on. Uh, a, a moment in which he's arguing that color should not make its way to architecture, that, w that it will not do that. But when he, by the time he's writing about Pesek in 1927, he describes the way in which color can make walls move, that it changes the, the whole architecture can be rewritten and changed. This becomes even clearer when he's explaining the logic behind the wallpaper, the colored wallpaper for Salubra, where he insists that color is primarily psychological, that it is the, it is the moment in which architecture becomes psychological. He organizes the color into, into sets of... Uh, there are 43 colors which organizes into 11 sets of 14 shades that make what he calls a keyboard, as you see on the left, and there's a kind of uh, symptomatically white cardboard that you can put over the top to compare different colors. It isolates the other colors uh, out of the picture. And there's an unpublished manuscript of 1931 on polychrome architecture, which he had written to explain these keyboards, which again, he insists that color is psychological, that it's architectural, that color can kill any defect in a physical form, it can, can remove the solidity of architecture, it can make walls recede or advance, it can control the movements of the eye and so on, and significantly insists that color is a form of classification, that it's a way of classifying things, it's a way of classifying buildings and parts of buildings. He says, color is as powerful an instrument of architecture as the plan and section are, better still, color is the very element of the plan and section. So it's just simply, uh, as, as Tout was arguing, simply material, 
part of the construction of architecture. It is, what, it is how architecture is to be constructed. And this was his uh, uh, line. And it's not just that he, didn't, he only did this one uh, strangely white building. And the fact that he preserved that building as white and preserved a white theory around it, even after he'd used color, is something that really needs analysis. And, and, but it's, 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 fa it's fascinatingly complicated. So let's move on into the downhill very, very fast. Just to, prove, just to prove that point, he refused to do all white buildings even when the clients asked for it. For instance, here, um, the Villa de of course, as you probably know from the image on the right. Uh, but here's an image on the left, one of the few images in which you see painters still working on the building. Uh, halfway through the painting of this building, the client said, no, I don't like it. It's dark green on the bottom, white on the top, and said, I want it all white, and, and Le Corbusier went to some lengths to make sure that he preserved the color scheme, which had a lot to do with the fact that the bottom half of the building, uh, it's a renovation, and the color is related to that fact. Uh, and it, but again, yet again, he's always producing this color and white in, in parallel as a logic, and it's precisely to intense. The way he got around it was to argue to the client that the white would be really white only with the, gr with the uh, uh, green there. If you take, let's say, um, his most famous white wall, right, uh, Ronchamp, he in fact insists that this is an exception precisely because it's white. He, he goes out of his way to say why this doesn't fit into the rest of his architecture. But even there, watch out because that white wall, the famous south wall, if you look at his drawing on the left of it, where the beveled surfaces going into the window are actually red, registered as white against a black background. So he does a reversal, right, which of course is similar to the effect that he's looking for on the right. In this drawing, in fact, the drawing itself has been cut out where the windows are and small bits of colored paper have been inserted in there so that that drawing can be held up to the light and he can see what it is for there to be flashes of color emerging within the white, which of course is the, what the design was, small pieces of stained glass. So here the biggest, whitest wall he ever did is precisely his most polemical illustration of the fact that white, as it were, emerges right out of the heart, that color emerges right out of the heart of white. And as you know, it's a, it's a fake wall. It's a wall, just, it's just a screen uh, on an open frame, unlike one of the other walls, which is built up around the, some of the original stones of the monastery. So again, even one sense of the depth of this wall and its substance is a particular effect that he's worked on. So we have to take effects like this very, very seriously. And of course, in his work, there's a lot of examples of this uh, smear of color inserted right at the core of, uh, uh, of white. Now, e moving super fast, uh, <laughs> time is of the essence. It's all related to dress. Here we have the uh, advertisement for the salubrious colors, which relate, of course, the cut of his suit uh, uh, to, the to, the, to the color as the clothing or the clothing of the, of the building, which in turn is closely linked to ideas about tents and nomads and so on, as is so clear from this image on the right, relating the White House to the, to the tent, which is a literal aspect of the work, right? Uh, the Pavilion de Tonne Nouveau, you, as you know, here's the outside and the inside. It's a classic illustration of the Semperian argument about architecture as a form of dress, that color is dress, that is the material substance of architecture. Even when describing this building, he describes the fact that the ground takes on a certain color because of the light coming through the canvas. You don't see the structure, right? The structure's on the outside. You live in this suspended color uh, uh, fabric. Um, most literal example, of course, final project, uh, one of the final projects, Heidi Weber Pavilion, again, structure polemically uh, uh, rendered as exterior to a, uh, uh, a kind of uh, suspended fabric, uh, uh, which is, uh, it becomes even clearer if you look at these, these um, the working, I was going to say working drawings, but they, again, the rhetoric is inappropriate. In fact, these drawings are made up out, out of small bits of colored wallpaper glued onto the paper. So even the construction of what we would once call a drawing is within the logic of color as a suspended fabric, a form of dress. Uh, and the only part that's not allowed to have that quality is the structure, which is m allowed to be visible, but visible as secondary to the main architecture. And again, we would have to do a lot of analysis. It's quite literal in the sense, of course, of the tapestries, which he was doing for quite some time, culminating, of course, in the Shandigar <coughs> tapestries. Again, the studies getting close to the final design and, and actually hanging in the building, the literal sort of example of that that goes all the way back to arguments from around 1915 and earlier where he as directly associated modernity with the changes uh, in women's clothing. Again, it's a highly sexualized argument all the way, to, all the way through, and this is, is shared by 
his apparent enemy in the debate at Weisenhof, Bruno Taut, which, who is also insisting that color in architecture is primarily dress. Uh, again, here we have um, his book of uh, 24, and on the right we have a, 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 the image of the sort of history of dress as it leads through from Egyptian. Everybody has their choice of where to begin. Uh, like Gideon, Egypt is good for Taut. Um, Parthenon is better for Le Corbusier, but anyway, they end up with the same uh, dress. And he, in, in the catalog for the Weisenhof Siedling, Taut chooses precisely a passage from that early book on, the, on his own house with the color panels, a passage which says, the house must fit the occupant like a good suit. It must clothe him. The main aesthetic principle is this. The look of the rooms without people in them is irrelevant. What counts is how people looked at them. In other words, this is the theory that architecture is a form of dress. To inhabit a building is to wear it in the way that we are all wearing um, this room tonight. And it seems to me it's common sense. You know? But it, there was, it went from common sense to a highly elaborate theory in the middle of the 19th century, and it went to that theory of architecture as dress precisely because at that moment, as you know, the archaeological digs were revealing the coloration on what was previously understood to be white marble buildings uh, of the Parthenon and so on. So it's in the face of color that the theory of architecture as dress e e emerges and, and it's in terms of that color that it should be understood. In Le Corbusier's case, that becomes absolutely perfectly captured by this Mercedes-Benz advertisement where they advertise one of their sports cars by aligning the dress of the woman uh, with that of the, uh, of the double house. Uh, and again, the black and white photograph giving us the sense that this is a white on white uh, argument. She's in fact holding... Uh, um, a black rag doll, so there's work to be done, uh, of course, and the issue of race is um, for another day. Anyway, at the time of the Weisenhof, it's not just that these architects happen to, it's sort of in the background, think of their architecture as a form of dress. All of the critics understood that and argued in those terms. All of the debate around the Weisenhof was about dress, uh, and it was very much linked to that of color. If we take, for instance, the beginnings of the historiography of modern architecture, and I'm Sorry to keep promising th you this, but we are at the end. Uh, shooting down, uh, so to speak, uh, Walter Behrens' the, the, the Victory of New Building Style, which is, of course is, the is a, one of the official books. Again, he was the editor of the, of the, of the Vicborn Journal at that time. He uses as his cover image the image which is coming from, from the, from the catalogue of the exhibition. He's announcing the victory of a new style before there is a new style, so it's a kind of preemptive uh, statement. Uh, uh, of victory, in which there's a long section on color uh, in, in the book, uh, understood as functional. There's a, a clear argument that color is functional and an important part uh, of the operations. Likewise, in the same year, and all of the history starts in 27, it starts in relationship to the Weisenhof Siedlung, despite the fact that it, it is thoroughly indebted to a long discourse going through the end of the 19th century and, and through and figures like Mutasius and others. Uh, what we think of today is the historiography of modern architecture, or let's say the assumptions that are embedded, that, that are so embedded in our thinking that we don't even think that they're assumptions, they start getting generated and consolidated in, 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 a, in a few short years after the Weisenhof. Both those books, uh, the Gustav Platz, the latest, new bu uh, latest building out, uh, which in fact has colored plates in it, uh, insists on color, and both talk about architecture in terms of dress, as does Adolf Benny's book uh, of, the, of the same year, and of course a very polemical association of the white tennis outfit with the uh, Kolk Zimmer project, uh, Meyer and so on. But again, you see the clear argument that's being made. Uh, also in Heinz and Bodo Rash's book, which is interesting because this is a book, uh, um, they did some of the furnishings for, the, for, furni for some of the apartments at the Weisenhof, but this is a book strictly about technical things, about the construction of the buildings at the Weisenhof. The color shows Walter Gropius's building under construction. Even there, what, get, what one gets is this association, this argument about modern architecture being uh, uh, modern dress. But all of this disappears, color, color, clothing, and fashion, which were bound so tightly together in 27 and the, a couple of years after that, quickly fade away, and clothing itself also goes away. If you look at Pevsner's Pioneers of, of the Modern Movement, 1936, color and clothing have gone. By 1937, even Walter Berendt, the same person who in 27 was able to devote a whole chapter to the functional virtues of architecture, can write his book, Modern Building, without talking about color. And by 42, of course, Gideon's able to write Space, Time, and Architecture, um, which is based on lectures from 38 and 39. So you can think of it as, as coming from that time, he completely ignores color uh, other from one, one little side note at one point in passing. 
So this is an institutional effect uh, with a very particular genealogy. Color was eased into the background to promote the image of the white wall. Indeed, the very success of this project, I would insist, was marked by the disappearance of white as an issue. In other words, if you really want to promote white, what you're looking for is the moment in white is so, is everybody's so convinced that white is modernity, is functionality, is abstraction as distinct from sensuality, is clarity as distinct from, uh, as masculinity, as distinct from femininity, and so on and so on. The real way to achieve in that is to get to the point where everybody does white and thinks about white but never talks about it. Right? Maybe don't, don't even think about it. And you can quite precisely determine how this was done by people like, particularly I think Henry Russell Hitchcock played a huge role in this. The way it worked was to single out, uh, out JPP out as the role model. And his, his work, particularly Hitchcock, points to this Hockman Holland project, which is uh, basically white walls with light aspects of color in it as the kind of key uh, project. Out's project for the Weisenhof ends up being winning all the prizes. Virtually every critic announces that this project is the single successful project of the Weisenhof Siedlung. Right. And again, it uses very light traces of color. Out at this time, Hitchcock wrote the first monograph of, on Out, declaring that he was obviously by far and away the only true master of modern architecture there was. Very quickly afterwards, Out was of course written off the Christmas card list for various uh, reasons, but uh, probably, the, probably the architect who was uh, the highest in terms of the reputation of the, of the would-be historians uh, would move from the highest to the lowest very, very uh, quickly. Again, just to show you uh, on the left, just to remind you again of the before-after, to understand how powerful that single layer of paint is. Um, it's added back in 23 with, with this uh, Literally, Vidorp, the white village, uh, that's the color scheme. Uh, now it's all getting renovated, right? Um, here's the Kiefot project, which is under renovation. Is the color on the left. Here it is. Give you a sense of what it is. This is the role model, right? And it's even today the case that the building like that will be described as white, right? Unproblematically white. But nobody has to say it's white, right? Because nobody's talking about color. And when I say that, let me hesitate for a moment. It's talked about by specialist historians of color, and one thinks of uh, Martina Colley and particularly Arthur Roerig's work. In other words, there are, there are uh, experts that are thinking nothing about this, but precisely they are marginalized relative to the discourse, and their work doesn't make it in. It has not significantly affected the ongoing history. I mean, books on the history of modern architecture come out about every six months, and that work has been largely unaffected by the incredible scholarship that's going on. A lot of it turning now on literally a kind of technical or chemical chemistry of trying to discover what the original colors were. This is an incredibly sophisticated science and there's a whole new, there's a whole new field of expertise in exactly the same way that there's a field of expertise for, let's say, recovering the color, colors of the Sistine Chapel and so on. And just as the recovery of the colors of the Sistine Chapel have been met with incredible controversy, despite the fact that the woman who has done it has pioneered a whole new set of techniques for discovering what the original colors were, when, with all the science available, she shows you the colors, they get rejected because all the scholars don't like it. They don't recognize the paintings anymore. Likewise with architecture, here's your obvious example. Um, the example that, that's just altogether too obvious. Because what would be really interesting, if you really had been very effective at, at producing the white image of modern architecture, then buildings would actually get renovated in white, and that's what's happened. Right? Time and time again, buildings of modern architecture got restored, get, got rid of their color, and re replaced with white. And here's your classic example, of course, uh, taking it through after the war, first renovation, and again, um, one of the rest, many stages of restoration, one of which involves Le Corbusier himself, who pushes a slightly whiter version of his argument. Um, again, one could look at the little phases where by, by which, for instance, the uh, rose color, which has a light blue on the other side of it, of the tower, finally gets accepted. We're quite late in the stages of restoration by the time uh, again, discomfort above, uh, a, lot of un a, a lot of doubt and controversy about what the original colors were, right? The science doesn't get rid of that. The interiors, you know it. I'm asking and suggesting that we all look again at these images this, and think about them again. Weisenhoff again, Mies on the left doesn't get the light pink. Out is pretty close. Much down, front and back. Uh, Gets a, gets a white back, um, where once it was supposedly yellow. And finally, the Weisenhof Siedlung, and some nice photographs of the interior. Uh, as
as it's been restored. Uh, and photographs which I think take, I, I think capture very, very well the kind of slippage between this white and the color, the, the in, impossibility of, of drawing the line that seems sometimes so clear but disappears. And my feeling is something like this, that, that, the, that the white wall is, is, is a sort of supercharged surface. It was invested with enormous energy and huge intellectual resources went to work um, by which the architects could be so committed to color and have the color re removed and one by one they concede defeat. Um, and then we are left with this white image and now we are in the moment of time in which the color is being restored uh, and it seems to me as the color comes back, it's nice for all of that psychodrama to come back as well and as having a kind of uh, interest in the weird stuff or, or the kind of uh, uh, incredible excesses of minimalist architecture. Right? The moment in which we think we've cleared away the excess, the moment that architecture portrays itself as in control, in that very moment there is this intense, uncontrollable outburst and in the, in the late 20s and early 30s, between 27 and 32, that discourse was very, very much alive and got ro wiped right out, such that by 1937 it doesn't exist. And my interest is in that, you know, trying to find out what that intensity is. And, and uh, you know, I apologize for the length, but it's a kind of long issue. Thank you. Please. Just before maybe those of you who have to leave, leave, I would like to make a couple of announcements.